Kyle, we appreciate you calling in. We hope your life is good. But ladies and gentlemen, it is time, okay? <gasps> this is a big deal, all right? So if you grew up in the 90s and you come from, you know, a working group of a community or anything like that, basically anybody, basically, uh, wrestling was obviously something that captivated the entire globe at the time. Everybody on earth was watching wrestling. And there was a couple faces of the entire thing, but really there was only two that carried the entire thing. And obviously one of them is The Rock who is selling tequila and doing mm -hmm. everything like that. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people loved it. But the man that resonated with me, my friends, I would assume with a lot of people that watch this show, ladies and gentlemen, a man who is Stone Cold oh, Steve Sir, sir, thank you so much for joining us. This is massive for us, man. I hope life is good. Oh, good. You're I'm, mute. Uh, I'm having a birthday today, and I've, I've been enjoying watching what you're doing. Well, happy birthday to you. I think we'll end this thing with a toast and a cheers to you for all that you've done. Congrats on another year around the sun, yeah. sir. Congrats on another year around the sun. Um, let's get right into it. Steve, uh, can I call you Steve? Yes, yeah, Stone Cold Steve. Absolutely. Steve. <laughs> When I was a kid, uh, I still wear them now. I mean, I wear jorts because of you. You know what I mean? Your battle with Vince McMahon, I think, gave the entire world about a, you know, people could live through you telling their boss to go fuck themselves. I mean, like everything you've done, I'm very appreciative of. And I go through your history in wrestling, you know, obviously stunning Steve and Hollywood. Whenever you landed on Stone Cold Steve Austin, how thankful were you? Because it feels like that's who you actually are. And it was it almost came naturally and easy to you. You know, and that, that's part of the process, man, finding out who and what you actually are and who you want to be. And, and it turns out when I was trying to be stunning Steve and when I first started off, I think it's, it's like a lot of people, you're, you're kind of almost trying to be a wrestler or pretending to be a wrestler. You have to be a wrestler. And when I found out, you know, like when I was lacing up to play college football or in high school football or doing anything competitive, and I'm very intense. And so, you know, professional wrestling, for whatever people think it is, is very intense and it's very competitive. And, uh, for, it, yeah, from a work aspect, it is what it is. But in a competitive uh, atmosphere, that is who and what I am. And when I discovered that and then I said, hey, man, let me just start, start talking all this shit I heard growing up in South Texas. It resonated <laughs> with people. And then when you fight, when you identify with that character, that gives you your base from which you have all of your foundation. And so character is so much a part and so important to the business. But you don't pick it up initially because you're so caught up in trying to learn how to work, uh, just the mechanics, then the psychology. But, man, it really starts and stops with an identity, and Stone Cold is who and what I am, 24-7. Yeah, well, that, I think that's why you've had so much success since being uh, in wrestling or whatever. And uh, Straight Up Steve Austin, by the way, Season 2 debuts Monday, January 11th on USA after Monday Night Raw. There's been some memorable moments uh, from that show that has come out. Also, your podcast on WWE Network is awesome. It is must-watch every single time. I really appreciate everything you do. Kind of give us a look behind the scenes of something that I was a massive fan of growing up whenever older wrestlers come back to the wwe they always uh, obviously not now because of quarantine and everything being shut down but you hear them talk about how they hope that the fans remember them right they always like they, that's like a conversation piece they're like you know when i go through that curtain i hope the fans remember me and no matter how big the star is i feel like a lot of people have said that it feels like still to this day and probably until you're done on this planet when that glass hits in an arena the place is going to explode is there ever a time where that gets old to you because it still happens every single time you go out there it has to be fucking awesome <laughs> that anytime you walk into a place first of all there's push and then everybody loses their mind even in a time where crowds don't do that anymore does it ever get old to you man if that feeling ever got old to anybody you might as well hit him in the head with a shovel and just get him out of the <laughs> You live and die by that. You know, from you, you've got to go out there in front of some crowds. Just it, it is what it is right now. But and plus, being on the football field, dude, you you know what it's like, and you live and die by that because it's that affirmation. It's like, hey man, yeah, these motherfuckers still remember, <laughs> and you know because now it's almost a thing. Like, hey man, Austin here is going to get this hellacious pop. I got to see it to believe it. So when it keeps happening, it's still like, you know. 
You live and die by it. Yeah, it, it, it's everything because you would think, dude, I retired in 2003 and I wish I could have rode, you know, down the road a few more years, but it was what it was. And so when you've been gone that long, people can forget, but I guess, and I'm blowing smoke up my ass, but I guess I resonated with the crowd so much <laughs> that they still remember. And I got to give a lot of props to, you know, the WWE Network and those video games that they keep coming up with that keep guys like me and all my peers you know, kind of still fresh in people's minds. So it, it is badass. And, and I'm so appreciative of it because, dude, I remember, you know, getting suplexed in Chevrolet dealerships way back in the day in Dallas, Texas, and working in front of shit crowds all over Tennessee. Territory was down. And then finally you make something, you come up with this character that is still resonating with people and they know who that guy is it's badass do you ever did you it doesn't sound like it now and i don't think anybody would blame you do you ever wonder if the pop is still going to be there does that ever happen for you and you talk about other people saying i want to experience this in person because whenever i was doing nxt events uh adam cole who's a scumbag by the way he absolute, scum, absolute scumbag <laughs> fucking loser <laughs> absolute fucking loser that guy but whenever he would do the adam cole bay bay at these takeovers it was the only time at the takeovers that the entire crowd now granted they would cheer for things and the nxt crowd is awesome but hearing that it was like back in the day almost and there was a couple times where i think michael cole was next to me he was like wait wait till you hear this or whatever and it goes and it's awesome and i the thought of people going to you like oh i can't wait until the glass shatters tonight though is there ever a thought for you that it's potentially not going to come or, or are you just at the point where you're like whenever they say that they're like yeah wait till you fucking hear it by the way and then just kind of walk by no, no, you never take it for granted. And, you know, we'll see when crowds come back. And, you know, one of these oh. days down the road, I get to uh, appear at another w WWE event. No, you don't take it for granted. You're hoping it's there. And when it is there, yeah, like I said, it's that shot of adrenaline up your ass. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. And there's nothing like it. If you could bottle it and sell it, you'd be a billionaire. But, no, you, you never just think it's going to be there or you're like, yeah, I got this shit. It ain't like that, man. It's nothing but appreciation. And then that's that blood, sweat, and tears and living that life and putting in the, the, the miles and, you know, the people living vicariously through all the storylines. And they remember that shit. And these other, the younger crowd, for some reason, you know, they're, they're in as well. So you, you never expect it or just count on it to happen, Pat. Well, I'll never tell you what to think, but you should expect it forever, I'd assume. You've done, <laughs> you've done a lot for a lot of people, including myself. I mean, there was a lot of us that our lives, we escaped watching you in the the run that you guys had, whether it was you and, you know, whether it was you in, in The Rock or you and Vin, Vince McMahon. You and Vince McMahon is maybe one of the best storylines in the history of wrestling. And hey, do you still talk to him at all? Do you still get a chance to interact with him? And how do you guys kind of, uh, you know, how do you feel about each other? Well, the last time I talked to Vince was down there in Tampa when I went down there to cut a promo in front of an empty crowd. And this was kind of right when COVID started. And it was really strange. And I wasn't happy with the creative because I wanted to just sit down and, you know, maybe do an interview with Byron Saxon or something to kind of talk about something that was a shoot. And Vince says, God damn, Steve, he goes, the people are just going to be uh, in a bad way. Just go out there and entertain them and do this promo. I went back to his trailer three times. So anyway, I ended up doing a promo. It sucked. It was hard. I really uh, appreciate how the superstars have adapted and overcome all that. Now they have the Thunderdome to help with some crowd noise. But to answer your question, that was the last time I got a chance to talk to him. I'm sure he's going to call me or text me happy birthday today. But, man, our relationship is strong. And when we were feuding there for damn near two years, you know, we I love that guy. And I'm sure he probably loved me too. But, man, there there was a lot of – you know, for a shoot, you know, a lot of times some animosity there, you know, when I uh, did some of the things I did. But, you know, I got nothing but respect for the guy, and we're in a real good place. For those that don't know, shoot means for real. Work means uh, you get it. The, For instance, Ariel Hawani and Booker T, we all think for shoot there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to shoot at this particular point. Uh, might end up being a work or whatever. Uh, whenever you look back on your career, coolest night, do you have one? Man, there, there were so many of them, you know, uh, stunning Vince at MSG because the garden's such a special building, uh, going to 13 with Brett doing that double turn uh, because the Chicago crowd is great. That Rosemont, because oh, yeah. of the acoustics, uh, the building is incredible. Uh, 17, lighting it up with The Rock, one of my favorite opponents. Uh, there, there's, there's been so, so many of them uh, that I couldn't just single out one. And, you know, my days when I was starving, you know, after two months in the business, I was driving a forklift, loading, unloading trucks. Jerry Jarrett had just brought the territory in Dallas from Fritz von Erich. 
Hell, man, they was beating the shit out of me on Friday nights and Saturday mornings with kendo sticks and leather weightlifting belts because I was this little baby face coming up with this long blonde hair, somewhat of a physique because I just got finished playing football at North Texas State. And I asked Jerry Jarrett, I said, hey, man, when can I start working full time? He says, hell, Steve, I think you're ready now. We'll send you to uh, Memphis in two weeks. Two weeks later, I was driving down the highway to Mid-South Coliseum in my base model 1988 Hyundai Excel. Woo! Payments were $154 a month. And I starved my ass off. And some of those days, starving and paying your dues and going through the process and riding down the road with the veterans, and they're sitting there dropping all this 411 on you and trying to help a brother out with information, those are some of the f- uh, most fun times uh, of my life, just traveling down the road with the guys in the car, drinking beer. Listening oh, yeah. listening to you and Undertaker talk to each other on your podcast while drinking a bottle of Jack, I believe, an entire bottle, I, I think, was <laughs> was done. The, the, it was awesome, by the way. And the fact that it was on WWE Network still is, is magical to the entire brand. But the conversations about the behind-the-scenes stuff, and I think that was where I first heard the story about him drinking um, Cypress, Cypress Hill to sleep or whatever, I think, was during that conversation. Uh, but there's a, there's a story, and I don't think I've heard it from people inside the business, just others. Did you used to drink beer with the crowds after shows? Was that something you used to do? You go in the ring and just drink more? Because, by the way, before we get to that, your catch percentage had to be 100% there for, uh, because those beers are coming out. You used to snag those. Now, granted, you missed one or two, I think, whenever you came back with the new IPAs. (laughs) I think you missed one or two, which was shocking, I will say. But back in the day, you might have had, you might have been the most shorthand catcher on earth at that point with those beers flying in. Yeah, them, you know, uh, I was a running back in high school, and then in, in uh, junior college, they moved me to linebacker. In North Texas, they moved me to defensive end. I always thought I would have made a little bit of an undersized at 6'2", 220 in my college days, maybe a little bit undersized as a tight end. But God dang, I could catch a football, <laughs> and I could damn sure catch a beer. And shit, man, if someone's going to throw you beers, and that's part of your job, make damn sure you catch them. But there, there wasn't too many I dropped. And I give a lot of, I'll give a shout-out to uh, – the bell ringer, the timekeeper, Mark Yeaton. He was the guy who would launch those beers. And sometimes, you know, I'd be in the ring and he'd be he'd be launching them and I'd be over in different parts of the ring. And he, he had one of the best arms ever. And sometimes I'd be <laughs> way across the ring, damn near up uh, on the ramp. And I'd give him the signal and he'd kind of shake me off like, I don't know if I should throw it. I said, no, motherfucker, if I don't <laughs> signal it, you throw it. And so he would launch him and goddamn. If I didn't catch it, that thing was careen off my hand and hit somebody in the head. So, you know, the stakes were high. <laughs> you know, I told people, I used to tell people towards the end, man, shit, I was, I was, uh, you know, drinking for a living, get paid for drinking. On, I was getting paid to drink for a living and wrestling on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. I mean, you would, there, we watched your best of earlier. There's like 10 of them on YouTube. Yeah. We watched them this morning. The moments where you would come in, not say a word, obviously, but you would stun somebody. They were dead. Then beers. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, let's get, hey, let's play the hits here. That's basically yeah. what it was. Glass hey, break, Pat. stunner, beers out. It was just, what a night. One time, a lot of times we would do that at TV taping just because the crowd was there and they'd crash the music and I'd go back down. Maybe, you know, I'd already done an interview or wrestled a match and I'd go out there just to entertain the crowd just to, you know, make sure they came back happy. And one time I just kept staying out there, staying out there somewhere in New York, somewhere, you know, where the union was involved. And uh, finally I went in and Vince called me to his office the next day and he goes, God damn, Steve. He goes, you cost me $14,000 extra dollars last night. <laughs> overtime on a crew so he's calling me out he goes i just cost him 14 extra g's just for that that crew to stay overtime and i so i'm like uh i'll split it with you <laughs> he goes guy he goes god damn he goes i don't want your money i'm just telling you he goes come on in a little bit earlier he used to do that shit all the time and, and towards the end kevin dunn in the truck He'd finally just get on the horn to the house. He'd go, Steve, come on in. So <laughs> we, that, that's how we rolled back in the day, man. We're going to give you your money's worth. So what did you do? The show's over. Okay, now the fans are still there. Glass would break one more time. Normally there's a dark match afterwards uh, bef- between two people you don't know. But your glass would break. Somebody would get a stunner or two. And then you would just go corner to corner, two beers. And your beer guy would just be, hey, I'm a, do you have 30? What's the most beer you did in one night you think of one of those shows? Well, I never forget when we went to Japan one time. Uh, Dudley, Stacy Keebler. I mean, there were so many people out there. We, I think we went through 103 or 108 
Now, between just for myself, you know, I'd always make sure to have about a 12 or 18 pack there. <laughs> and, you know, here's the thing when some people say, oh, shit, man, you got too much of that beer on you. You don't even know how to drink beer. It's like, dude, fuck you. <laughs> you don't know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to entertain 20,000 people in an arena. If I just go out there and sip it real properly, how fucking exciting is that? <laughs> So when you're out there on an empty belly and you're shotgunning beers and all that shit's going in, the, the half that was going in was for me. The half that was going on was for them. Nice. But I'm telling you, Pat, when you when you shotgun a bunch of beers like that and you're drinking about half of each beer, you got a pretty damn good buzz when you come out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a sacrifice I was willing to make. <laughs> single night. I would uh, assume you're pretty fucked up, yeah. By the way, I'm, we... Uh, in your in your honor, probably should have asked, I guess, but there's no way I could have got a hold of you to this. Uh, we had Stone Cold season where uh, we were trying to promote all of our followers instead of drinking beers, just go ahead and Stone Cold every beer that you have. And uh, there's a lot of people that didn't know what the fuck they were doing, to be honest with you. But I feel like that Stone Colding it, it still is making another run too, just like everything else for you. So congrats on all that, man. Oh man, it's it's, it's been great. When did you start uh, you self cheersing? Know, when did you start self cheersing? Was that something you did in college? You're like, hey, hey, Steve, good for me, man. <laughs> when did that start? No, you know what? Uh, you know, I got to give credit to Sandman for starting that, but he was bashing him off his head, and and I don't remember. And it wasn't because Sandman was doing it, so I don't want to say I copied him, but he was the first. So, and then my style was because people always get us confused. I say, "Yeah, man, you used to bang them on your head." No, motherfucker, no, I was the guy that clacked them together. <laughs> it was just something we came up with. I don't know how the, the beers got introduced to the ring, but it became a thing, and we ran with it, and it worked great. And so, all these years later, people still doing it. And I, I guess Stone Cold in a, a beer is a thing now. Oh yeah, but people have been drinking beer for hundreds and thousands of years. So, <laughs> hey, I'm just pr I'm proud. To, I'm proud of the fact that I got my own beer to drink because. Tonight, uh, I've been kind of, uh, I just got finished filming my show, Straight Up Steve Austin, and we were lucky to get that in the can because of COVID. So that, that's going to uh, season premiere on January 11th on USA after Raw. But, you know, uh, I, had, I had to get in shape for that show, and I dropped. You know, when COVID first hit, I got that COVID-15 like everybody else, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But I was drinking margaritas and drinking beers oh, and yeah. shit like that, so I got all tuned up. To, I, went, I went down to 2.30, Pat. Oh. I ain't been 2.30 since I was in college. So now that I'm kind of at a relaxed state, I'm going to be banging him some bitches together, and I'm going to be crushed a few uh, Broken Skull IPAs tonight. Yeah, <laughs> as you should for your birthday, by the way. Uh, I mean, happy birthday. I know the boys got a lot of questions for you. Do you have some time still? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you go ahead. Hey, Nick, what do you got? Steve, you had so many vintage moments with Vince. Uh, the Zamboni into the ring, the beer truck, filling his uh, Camaro or Corvette up with cement. Did you guys come up with that together? Were those all his ideas? Were they your ideas? How did that work? Man, those were mostly all of their ideas. Like, I mean, I'm not going to – it'd be hard for me to say, you know what, Vince, I'm going to drive a monster truck. It's going to have 1,800 horsepower, and I'm going to crush a Lincoln Town car on an ITV. <laughs> you know, and here's the thing about this is shoot. Uh, they bought that uh, gold Lincoln Continental that was the rocks, allegedly, off the showroom floor. That's the kind of money they were willing to put in behind this stuff. And uh, so, and they, I learned how to drive the monster truck right before we went on live TV. <laughs> you know, so there, I, I can drive anything on wheels. And going back to that Corvette thing with the cement, they didn't have a mark for me to hit. And that was a different kind of cement truck. The way I had to pull those levers for all that stuff to fall down, I nailed it because it's live TV and you can't fucking fail. <laughs> and, and when they told me I was going to be destroying a brand new Corvette because I'm such a car fan, uh, I, I was like, man, do we got to really fill a, see, the Corvette up with CMN? I said, because I was trying to get the Corvette after the gig, right? <laughs> give, give <it> to <laughs> the icing on the cake was when that damn glass broke on the passenger side. Yeah. So it was badass. That was a nice all Coliseum. I'll never forget it. But they thought of those uh, ideas. And, you know, Pat, sometimes we'd be dragged out on the road so many times. You know, you get tired. And, you know, shit ain't going great at the house or whatever. It's a grind. Your back's killing you. You're all fucked up. Being on the road is a grind, but it's the best job and the most fun I've ever had. Then all of a sudden, you find out that you're tearing the shit out of a damn Continental. You're driving a monster truck. You're filling a Corvette full of cement. Those, you know, going to Monday Night Raw was like therapy for me because that was where I could unleash hell 
It was on somebody else's dime, and people were eating it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the hospital bed, the grocery store. Oh, I mean, there's just the, you dressed up as a fireman. I mean, there is. Just, we ran through them all this morning, mm -hmm. and it was like we were kids again. But I think something that you started that is still happening. I mean, is still what? Oh. What? 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 I was watching some videos of you cutting some promos before I had to go cut a bunch of them, right? Uh, I started watching you. I watched The Rock, obviously. I watched some uh, The Generation X talk before I went out there just to kind of catch the vibe. You know, I'm trying to get back in the vibe of it because I thought I wanted to be a little bit different, maybe a throwback style or whatever. But I was watching a couple and it was before the crowd had started doing the what. But you were saying something and you ended it with what? Like, like you, did, you said something, you didn't even let them answer. And I found it very hilarious. But I also was like, oh, this must have been in the early stages of what how did that come to be and it is amazing still to this day whenever you have somebody that cuts a promo like this and you know that they're thinking and the entire time they stop every fourth word and, and the crowd <laughs> is like what what like it's still going on it is electric how do you think of that how did that start and uh were you surprised to see it catch on as quickly as it did you know, uh, uh, very surprised that it caught on like it did. But I started that when I was a heel. And I remember calling Christian up one day on the road and he didn't answer his phone. So I left him this message and I was telling him, you know, just talking shit. You know how you leave prank messages for, oh, yeah. for guys. Yeah, yeah. And then I would say something and I, I would go, what? And I'd say <laughs> something else. And I said, what? And I was like, oh, man, I think I got something here. I got to put it in context. But, you know, so then on, on the stick, you know, in the ring as a heel, I'd be dressing somebody down or whatever, ask them a question, and I'd say, what? You know, kind of like, you know, it's kind of like really fucking with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and then as a baby face, you know, with, with the crowd, you know, you know, with creating that cadence and that pause, it just turned into a thing. And then we turned it into a T-shirt. So who would have ever thought, you know, someone could get over, I'm not blowing smoke up my ass, but who would have ever thought a, a son bitch could get over a word like what and make it a thing? But that's how it started. And, you know, Kurt Angle and some of my other opponents were so good about working in the frustration and putting in that pause for the crowd to give the feedback to further infuriate them. So it worked for everybody that did it. And for the people that say, hey, man, stop the what stuff. It's the worst thing ever invented because it's fucking up promos. No, if, you, if you're not smart enough to leave out the pause, <laughs> then you don't know how to do a promo. <laughs> you, can out, you can outsmart the fucking what. You know what I mean? <laughs> I thought that as well. As I'm watching and people are doing it, and you see them getting mad. And I'm like, uh, I think they're mad for shoot right there. I think that's a real anger right there that the crowd's doing. It, it was like, well, just keep talking there then. Just go ahead and power right through it. Um, man, there, there was, we watched you this morning. You undressed Undertaker and uh, he wanted a shot at the title or whatever. He said, uh, you think you deserve a championship because you have dead man on your shirt? What? The crowd went, what? What does that mean? You're dead? What? What? You don't have any blood? What? Your heart doesn't beat? What? The crowd started doing We're, when you're out there and you you started going, were those scripted? Were you trying to just break the other person? What was the mindset when you were going out there? No, man, that's that's really about a ninety percent ad lib. You might think about it for a second. Uh, a lot of times when I was thinking of rattling off liquors, you know, that I was oh. going to drink, whether it's Coach or someone like what? that doing an interview, I'm thinking, goddamn, you know, because I I, I I got my staples, but it's not like you know I know every type of alcohol that they're, they're at the that there is out there. So hell, I'm sitting there in, in my damn head trying to think of, hey, don't look like a dumbass here. Keep it going. <laughs> so it's just, it's really just riffing out there and having fun. And it's okay to repeat stuff as well. So, you know, I'm not a rocket scientist. I, 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 I just think people were digging what I was doing and I was having fun doing it. Yeah, well, it was amazing. You know, when you're thinking too much out there, Pat, it ain't worth the shit. I don't think you at know, all. I've been watching your promos, and, and I, I give you, I, I'm going to talk about you for a second, man. Dude, you've been lighting people up on the horn, so I know you've got to always kind of have a uh, the ability, well, obviously the success of your show, the, the articulation, the eloquation, and the intelligence Whoa. to put together, you know, just a sharp-ass promo that, you know, makes people feel something, whether you're riling them up, pissing them off or whatever. It's the ability to, to, to put out information, people process it, and then also the attitude and the, the delivery with which you're putting it out at. So congrats to you. Oh, well, th oh, yeah. thank you. That means a lot. You called me badass the other day. I wish I could hang it on my fridge like the old days. <laughs> One of the coolest things I've ever heard. Thank you for that. We have a question from at Viva Lazito in here. Big fan, by the way. Zito, what do you got? Oh, uh, Mr. Stone Cold, best match ever. What is it? Man, well, I had so many of them on the road. I had a 30-minute Broadway with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat at the L.A. Forum. 
and there wasn't no cameras there because it was just a house show. And that was one of my best matches. And, you know, because I'm such a huge Steamboat fan and him and Flair had the trilogy and some of the best matches of all time in the history of the business. But, you know, probably just just for, for crowd feel and for what it was, I got to go to 13 with Brett. I got to go to 17 with Rock. 14, me winning the title from Sean wasn't a great match. Uh, Sean's, you know, one of the best talents in the history of the business. But those those two would be at the top. I love I love my match that I had with uh, with with uh, Benoit and Edmonton uh, on SmackDown. I had about twenty minutes we had worked the night before. Uh, they shorted us on time, and I and I I came up with this comeback for him. I said I'm I'm seeing ten belly to belly or belly to back suplexes, whatever they were. I said I'm not seeing a traditional comeback. And I said if they tell us to go if they tell us to go home, I said fuck it. We're going to go as long as I want to. I got the heat. <laughs> we went out there and ripped it up. So I was really proud of that match, too. <laughs> well, you, by the way, congrats to you. Just being like, uh, well, I think I've earned this right to do this. How do you feel about the way this man is dressed right now, by the way? You, you kind of powered right through that. <laughs> what do you mean? Dude, I know. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? I love it. <laughs> I love you. And Ty, what do you got? Uh, Stone Cold, have you considered uh, continuing to act, or is that something you're kind of putting on the back burner? Because The Condemned is one of my favorite movies of all time, and I just didn't like – you had that run there where you were just coming out hit after hit after hit. Uh, are you more focusing on your show, or like, are you, are you going to get back into acting at all? No, you know, would I act? I would. But and when I came out to L.A., you know, that was, you know, I'd ret- I would got forced into retirement while I needed to retire. So I did. And I spent three years wasting time hunting, fishing, drinking, and doing a lot of stupid shit. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. And finally, <laughs> I told myself, I said, dude, you know, I didn't want to go back to driving a forklift after you've been on top of the wrestling world. So I said, you better take your ass out to Los Angeles and see what you can do out there in that world because you still have somewhat of a name. Because I didn't have an exit strategy because I didn't want to exit. I took my ass out to L.A. and moved in with Diamond Dallas Page. He had a condo, and I rented a room for him, and I fucked around out there for another year and a half. And finally, we started making him low-budget movies. You can call them independent movies if you want to, but these are low-budget. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, we did a Condemned, and that was a high-budget movie. They spent $20 million on that on that movie. And I had a blast filming that one. And I think I was thinking at the time, man, i got to learn how to become a really good character or whatever the movie calls for me to be. Hell, if I'd have been smart, I, I would have just done Stone Cold. At all times. To answer your question, yeah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's like, you know, I'm not antisocial. I like being around people. But I don't like to – being on a set is kind of like, would I do it? Yes. But being on a set is kind of like doing the, the same shit over and over and over and over again. And I hate fight scenes because I was, you know, a professional wrestler at a very high level. And that's like a dance out there, man. People think, ah, it's choreographed. Bullshit. You don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that's knowing how to work. So there's a lot of things I don't like about that. Uh, I love hosting my show, Straight Up Steve Austin. I love that. I love doing the Broken Skull sessions. Awesome. I love being busy, and, and I want to keep being productive, but it's, it's not something that I aspire to be. At one time in my life, it was a means to an end. As a means to an end, it led me to hosting and reality television, and that's what I'm really enjoying now because I do that. I film that. Then I go do my other shit. I go get on my damn uh, four wheelers and my side by sides, and I ride up in the mountains. I get the fuck out and, and have a good time. Hey, your dog's a superstar too. Mm-hmm. Love following along with the dog. Uh, Tony Diggs, what's your question, Mr. Cold? When you were talking about acting in, in the longest yard, when Mr. and you Cold. talked about how your football playing career, when you got those pads back on, did you, did it bring back some type of feeling? And how hard was it not to just lay somebody out when they were coming through the hole? Well, the rib was. <laughs> They didn't have a fucking stunt double for me. (laughs) When we filmed that movie, we we started off in New Mexico. It was hotter than blazes. You're standing out in the sun. Pat, I got up to 275 for that. Oh, me playing running back. (laughs) Good for the knees. Good for the knees. You know know when you're trying to run through those footballs? I mean, you're trying to run through those tires and you're holding the football? And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? They don't have a stunt double for Stone Cold Steve Austin? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then afterwards, you know, me and me and Kevin Nash, we'd go to the to the bar at the hotel we were staying at, and and the the, the cast and crew they could not believe the calamity of the volume of alcohol that we were putting down. 
over the course of three months. They couldn't fucking believe it. So you know, that's that's coming from that. I was bringing my pro wrestling background. <laughs> yeah. And just to comment further on that movie, it was a real fun movie. And Adam Sandler is such a class act. But if you remember the one time, I believe it was Bob Sapp when he clotheslined me when I had to football when I shit myself. <laughs> now, because, you know, when I do act, I am method. I actually shit myself. Yeah. <laughs> Hell, yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I segued from the co- from the question. I just caught up, got caught up telling different stories. That's no, hey, that, that's, that's all we're here for, pal. If we could just listen to your stories for the next five hours, that would be uh, beautiful and thank you for your time the rock how come there hasn't been a movie where you're steve austin and he's the rock oh, yeah. it just feels like this is an easy an easy make here it would be a worldwide number one box office oh, yeah. success yep. within a matter of time how come that hasn't happened yet well i i think I, that might mess with his credibility a little bit i think he's worked <laughs> long and hard and people forget <laughs> how long he's been out there in, in in the acting world now you know he's been out there longer uh, acting than he was in wrestling and True. so although he will always know, be known as a wrestler and one of the top entertainers of all time he's the biggest movie star in the world so i, I think he takes his credibility very serious and he doesn't need me to do a buddy <laughs> flick with him to, to stay on top being the number one guy so you know it, it is what it is and, and i'm not looking to do that movie by the way so that's why <laughs> but, but i mean if the rock wanted to do that movie then all he'd have to do is say hey dude come up with this yeah is it going to happen no. No, no no but people always ask me that's why I, I think it's you know really the integrity of his career and he doesn't need to do it and, and i wouldn't press him to do it anyway oh, man you're awesome dude we got to like we powered right through our heart out with Sirius. We have another one coming here in about a minute. I mean, we've just been talking on YouTube here for the last five minutes or so. The internet loves you, dude. Like it is you. Whenever we found out you were coming on the show, I was so pumped, man. You are everything that they make you out to be, bub. You know what? We were supposed to uh, uh, get together a long time ago on a podcast. Yeah. And then uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll reach out and we'll swap numbers, but I'll stay in touch with you. Uh, Cause the hell at first, at first, I like I was like, man, this dude ain't serious. You know, you know what the fuck he's talking about? He didn't even talk to me. I don't know how big a wrestling fan you were. So shit, man. I, and and I wasn't trying to dish you all those all those days. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad to talk to you and let's stay in touch. Yeah, you got it, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Living legend, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Happy. Oh wait, 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 wait. Whoa, I, whoa, I, I made whoa, a. Whoa. Uh, I have a. Uh, oh. It uh, doesn't matter where you're at. Go ahead and raise your glass wherever you may be, whatever you're drinking. Um, to the man that chugs some beer and kicks some ass, who once said, fuck fear, and broke some glass. A man who was a hero to the working class and told his boss to kiss his ass. A man who's in the Hall of Fame should be every day. Happy birthday. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Cheers to you, buddy. Thanks for stopping by. Have a good one, Thanks, brother. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate you guys. What a fucking legend. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're live in four, three, <laughs> two.